December 16, 1976. Amtrak train number six comes screaming through a curve outside Ralston, Nebraska at 53 miles per hour, and the lead locomotive just walks off the rail. It takes 11 cars with it. 63 people are injured. Track inspectors show up, measure everything, and here is the kicker. The track met federal standards. Key measurements such as speed limits, curve geometry, and basic track parameters were found to be within applicable federal limits. So what happened? It was an SDP-40F, brand new, EMD's best passenger unit. It had the same engine as the SD-42, the most successful freight locomotive ever built. Nearly 4,000 SD-42s were operating across North America with similar trucks and suspension without a comparable pattern of derailments. But the SDP-40F suffered 13 derailments in three years. That's the mystery nobody could explain, and nearly 50 years later, rail fans still argue about it. One railroad figured out how to fix these locomotives. They made a small number of targeted modifications and continued operating them for nearly two decades without the same instability issues reappearing. Amtrak never even tried. The SD-42 came out in 1972 with a 16-cylinder 645E3 turbocharged prime mover putting out 3,000 horsepower. It rode on HTC trucks with six axles, a brand new design that used a longer wheelbase and better weight distribution. EMD built nearly 4,000 of them between 1972 and 1989. Burlington Northern bought 836. Union Pacific got 686, and everyone wanted them because they were reliable as a hammer. The SDP-40F was supposed to be the passenger version of that success. When Amtrak formed in 1971, they inherited 20-year-old E-units held together with bailing wire and prayers. They needed new power fast, so EMD took their SD-42, stretched the frame about 4 feet, added a cowl body and two steam generators in the back for passenger car heating. Amtrak ordered 40 units immediately, loved them, and ordered 110 more. Then the derailment started. The first one was 1974, then another, then another. Always the same pattern, high speed, cold weather, and curves, with a baggage car coupled directly behind the locomotive. The rear truck would lift, walk sideways, and take the rail with it. Crews reported rough riding behavior early on, but those concerns were not acted on in a way that prevented further incidents. Engineers said the SDP-40Fs yawed, the back end swinging side to side like the whole locomotive was hunting for center. It made them nervous, it made passengers airsick, and it made trackside detectors scream about lateral forces that should not exist. December 1976, Ralston was not even the worst derailment. It was the one that made the NTSB investigate more closely. Their report said the cross ties were deteriorated and could not handle the lateral forces. But the track met Class 4 standards, legal for 60 miles per hour passenger service. SD-42 locomotives ran over similar track every day, hauling freight with no problems. So why were SDP-40F locomotives associated with derailments on track that freight locomotives routinely operated over without similar problems? Nobody had a good answer, so investigators started throwing out theories. One theory blamed the hollow bolster HTC trucks. The SDP-40F locomotives got a special version with a hollow bolster instead of a solid bolster, supposedly to improve ride quality. EMD tested them repeatedly and could not find anything conclusive. The hollow bolster theory remained unproven, but the reputation stuck. Another theory blamed water sloshing. The locomotives had a split fuel and water tank under the frame, plus a large water tank above the frame for the steam generators. Water sloshes around, creating lateral momentum that can amplify any hunting tendency. It made sense on paper, but nobody proved it definitively. A third theory blamed lightweight baggage cars. FRA investigators noticed that most derailments had a lightweight baggage car coupled directly behind the locomotive. That light car could create harmonic vibrations at certain speeds, creating harmonics that amplified forces. The locomotive pushes, the car pushes back, and the frequencies can line up wrong, producing destructive resonance. The math worked, but testing remained inconclusive.
The fourth theory blamed the lack of alignment controlled couplers. Regular couplers allow too much lateral play. When a locomotive enters a curve, the coupler can shift and create a jackknifing force that amplifies any tendency to derail. Some discussions suggested this was part of the problem. By the late 1970s, investigations remained inconclusive about the root cause. But before we get there, we need to talk about the panic that spread through the industry. Several host railroads began restricting SDP-40Fs from operating on their tracks. Burlington Northern said no. Chessie System said no. Conrail looked at those 13 derailments and decided they were not going to touch anything with HTC trucks. When they ordered their SD-42 locomotives, Conrail specifically told EMD to give them the old flexi-coil trucks. Not because SD-42 locomotives were derailing, but because Conrail's management became concerned enough about the SDP-40F derailments that they placed operating restrictions on locomotives equipped with HTC trucks on their system. They limited existing HTC locomotives to 40 miles per hour, and they ordered every new locomotive with old-style flexi-coil trucks instead. This was happening in the late 1970s, years after the HTC had been standard on SD-42 locomotives with thousands in service and zero issues. That did not matter to Conrail. It gets better. In 1981, EMD introduced the SD-50 with HTC trucks as standard equipment. Conrail ordered 105 of them and specified flexi-coil trucks. They were the only railroad in North America to do that. They were so concerned about the SDP-40F that they were still ordering old-style trucks on brand-new locomotives years later. One locomotive's problems influenced an entire railroad's locomotive orders for years. Meanwhile, Amtrak was stuck because they could not use their best locomotives on half the network. Routes kept getting restricted, and schedules became unreliable. EMD offered solutions, but Amtrak looked at the cost in their situation and decided to order different locomotives instead. They went with the F40PH, a locomotive with a conventional frame, no cowl body, no steam generators, and standard head-end power. By the early 1980s, most SDP-40Fs were being phased out. 18 of them were sold to the Santa Fe Railway in a horsepower-for-horsepower -horsepower trade. Everybody figured Santa Fe would use them for parts. Santa Fe had other plans. They took those 18 locomotives to their San Bernardino shops and rebuilt them completely, gave them a new designation SDF-42, and made three changes. First, they replaced the hollow bolster HTC trucks with conventional HTC bolsters, the solid kind that went under every SD-42 ever built. Second, they emptied the water tanks and filled them with concrete, no sloshing, just ballast. Third, they converted the split fuel and water tank underneath to straight fuel capacity. Some sources mention they added alignment-controlled couplers too, though this is harder to verify from primary documentation. Santa Fe then placed them into freight service, where they operated until 2002, without the instability and derailment issues that had affected them in passenger service. Just 3,000 horsepower, pulling freight over the kind of track that SDP-40Fs had problems with years earlier. They retired them as life expired, normal retirement, not because they were problem children, but because they were old. Three modifications, concrete, a different bolster, and possibly some couplers. So here is the question, why did not Amtrak try it? EMD offered solutions, Santa Fe proved the fixes worked, and all Amtrak had to do was follow a similar approach. They had 150 locomotives. They could have rebuilt them in batches, tested the results, and rolled out the modifications if successful. Cost would have been significant, but possibly less than buying 150 brand new F40PHs. They did not test it. Maybe the money was not there. Maybe the railroad restrictions killed support for the idea. Maybe after 13 derailments and 63 injured passengers at Ralston alone, nobody wanted to touch those locomotives again. Or maybe Amtrak realized they had bought a passenger locomotive that freight railroads were restricting, which created operational problems for a passenger railroad that did not own the tracks. We will never know for sure. What we do know, the SD-42 and the SDP-40F were essentially the same locomotive underneath. One sold nearly 4,000 copies and became legendary. 
The other sold 150 copies and got restricted from portions of the rail network. Nearly 50 years later, the exact cause remains debated. The hollow bolster theory was never conclusively proven. The water sloshing theory made sense, but lacked definitive evidence. The baggage car harmonics theory had supporting mathematics but unclear test results. The alignment controlled coupler theory comes mainly from enthusiast discussions rather than official reports. The NTSB blamed deteriorated track conditions. EMD's extensive testing remained inconclusive, but Santa Fe's practical fixes worked. Pick your explanation because they are all defensible and none are definitive. That is what makes this story persist in rail fan circles. It is not a mystery with a clear answer. It is an engineering problem where the solution came from trying different approaches until something worked. Santa Fe just modified things systematically and tested the results. You are supposed to understand the failure mode, model the fix, test the theory, and then implement the solution. Santa Fe said, forget that detailed analysis. Let us fill the water tanks with concrete and see what happens. It worked, and Amtrak never tried the same approach.